Hi, everyone. It's Lydia with the Oneness Junkie podcast. I am so excited to introduce y'all to my guest today. I've got Federico Marquez here. Hi, Federico. Hey, Lydia. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's so exciting to have you on my show today. So basically, you guys know, if you've listened to any of my episodes, I like to start off by telling the guest and the audience whether I know my guest or not. And today, I actually know my guest really well. (laughs) We have worked together over the probably like 13 years total, but we haven't really worked together for the last almost two years. So I invited Federico on today because I want to talk about some very important things that he's working on. So many of you know that the reason for my podcast and why I started it is because I wanted to start highlighting individuals that were using their time and their talents to basically make the world a better place. I just thought it'd be fun to see who all is out there doing amazing things and then highlight those people. So I feel like Federico qualifies. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper in why I think he qualifies for having using being able to use his time and talents to make the world a better place. So I want to see, Federico, if you'll just start out by giving the audience a little background about where you're from, where you came from, kind of what you've done, all leading leading you up to this point for this conversation today. Oh, okay. No, happy to do so. Uh, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. It's been all quite a We'll do the nuggets. How about the nuggets? The nuggets. All right, there you go. Uh, Well, hey, I was uh, born in Texas, grew up in Clute, Texas, which is a very small town south of Houston, Uh, graduated, got a tennis scholarship, uh, went to University of Houston. And uh, next thing you know, I'm working at Bayer as an intern at Bayer um, uh, in Baytown, Texas. And uh, because of a, a, a health issue, it was actually due to weird allergies that I got. Next thing you know, I'm doing a little bit of work at Stennis Space Center with NASA, and it was on a whim. You know, when you're young and you read articles, you're just like, I'll take a road trip, and that's exactly what happened. But that uh, road trip introduced me to the uh, scientists at Stennis Space Center in the early 90s when they are working on bioregenerative life support systems for advanced manned spaceflight. Um, I was very fortunate that they, they introduced me to hydroponics. And hydroponics, they were using it to clean air, clean water, and grow food in space. In fact, they even had a little tiny uh, moon base uh, that would house four astronauts. It was called the NASA Biohome. So I was actually very fortunate to actually tour that facility, learn as much as I could. Their budget was cut, and they said space exploration is over. So that was it. But that's what really got me started at looking very closely at hydroponics. A few few years later, I built my first greenhouse at Bayer in the Baytown, Texas facility to treat industrial wastewater using plants and hydroponics. Um, It was a little bit crazy because I was like 24, 25, and uh, now I have a couple of NASA scientists working for me as consultants, (laughs) and everybody thought it was nuts that we were building a greenhouse and a chemical plant. Um, The fortunate part was it worked very well. Uh, We were able to treat the water. People were just shocked at how well everything worked. It took a while. It was a year and a half of pure headaches and and constant uh, brick walls and trying to figure out how to get everything to work properly because this was some pretty nasty water we were treating. But at the end of the day, it was completely potable, just like uh, the system that we designed uh, should have worked, and it worked very, very well. But that sort of launched my career at Bayer. I had another 19 years at Bayer. I was their head of quality and innovation. And um, life was pretty good, (laughs) except for I was traveling all the time. In 2007, left Bayer um, because I had a lot of patents and a lot of interesting ideas. And I needed a, as my wife said, you're an entrepreneur. If you don't do it now, you're never going to do it. You're going to regret it for the rest of your life. So left Bayer in 2007 and uh, on a whim, um, and that actually was because my wife was diagnosed with celiac disease and I had never heard of celiac disease and we just had twins and all of a sudden I'm learning all about celiac disease and nutrition. And I never really paid too much attention to nutrition at the time, but it was because of nutrition 
that I wrote a little business plan that I was going to consult on and wanted to start a restaurant that would at least address uh, people, who, uh, celiacs and people who are uh, allergic to gluten, as well as organic food. I was in Houston, we're the fourth largest city. Houston had no organic food at all, had no uh, gluten-free options at all. Never even heard the word gluten-free. No vegan options, no superfoods. I mean, it was a pretty barren landscape. Um, but uh, we got can, can, of- I, can I add right there? Yes. Actually, this is when I met you in 2008. This is when we started working together. So this part of your story, I'm excited for you to share and I'm very familiar with. Yes. And, and Lydia, you were a big part of that with the marketing and getting us with the ground grassroots community building. So appreciate everything you did because that we were doing something really new. I mean, no one knew exactly what the heck we were. It's like, what is it a vegan restaurant? Is it a, what's this gluten thing? What's celiac? And they have, oh, but people said, oh, they have organic options. And Houston at the time had zero organic options. Right. Not only that, you were trying to do it sustainably. So you were merging your green love for being environmentally friendly with your need to solve a problem for your wife, celiac, and everyone else's problem. How many people in the population were having this problem? Remember? Yeah. 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 When I did the research, remember, I'd, I'd never done a restaurant before. I had no interest. Actually, I was going to consult on the project, <laughs> but the investor said, you wrote the business plan. This is your plan. I'm going to give you the check, but you're not going to be a consultant. You're going to be an owner. You're going to make it happen. You're going to make it happen. So that's really how I got pulled into it. But no, um, I had really great success at Bayer on sustainability projects. It was always something I was focused on, uh, the environment, uh, solar, fuel cells, battery technologies, electric cars, all that. But food was very new to me. But I did know, um, I reached out to the uh, Green Restaurant Association uh, in Boston. And I said, hey, how many green restaurants do you have in Texas? And they said, one. It's in Plano. And I said, really? Oh, my God. Because I wanted to see one. And I said, well, what about Houston? It's the fourth largest city. Nope, nothing, zero. So I, I met and the with- light bulbs, the light bulbs started going off. Yeah, I just said, hey, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be green. If I'm going to work on any project, it's going to be a green project. So um, mm-hmm. I got the information from them and we said, I looked at it. I said, there's no reason why we can't be the greenest restaurant in Texas in two years and maybe the greenest restaurant uh, in the world in, um, in the next two after that. Um, and as you know, that's exactly what we did. <laughs> so that was a really good, uh, very good start. And that's um, that's how we got Rogel Screen going. But the key thing there was really learning more about nutrition because the green aspect was a big part of it, but really trying to understand why is there no organic? Why is there, are, there are no superfoods? Why are there no vegan options? Why are there no gluten-free options? Um, and you know, as I started learning, there there were really there was really no supply chain. There was nothing to feed those restaurants. So started really learning more and more about the food industry, which was completely new to me. And um, as you know, we built the first one. Um, literally ran out of money after about a year, and we're like, oh my god, what's gonna? And then all of a sudden, the word got out or something happened. Maybe it was media, media coverage. But business took off and we just exploded, Um, built the second one. um, And then the second one was the one where we were able to do all kinds of different things. And we were for a brief period of time, 90 days, we were the greenest restaurant in in the world. And we we have a T-shirt to prove it. That's right. (laughs) So uh, but uh, but everything we did was always top tier uh, certified green restaurant through the Green Restaurant Association. Yeah. But, it was, but it was the quality of the food and learning more about nutrition that was new. And it was, I give my wife full credit for that because I knew nothing about nutrition. And now I'm meeting with nutritionists and I'm meeting with dietitians and I'm meeting with folks from MD Anderson and Baylor College of Medicine. And, and the school systems. School systems. And I'm like, wow, boy, do we have a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. So, Wait, yeah. Can I just add something? Can I just add a little caveat? When when you were going through that, when you mentioned the supply chain that you were learning about, 
what we've learned, not only in the that in hospitality restaurant industry, but also in your current industry that, and I want the people to hear this, that demand dictates response. So the reason you couldn't get organic sugar to make an organic cake was because the demand of the consumer and the people was not there. They have to make their voices heard. If they want organic, if they want local, they need to demand it. And the commercial operations will go find the way to meet the demand. That's what the kind of bottom line is about all these industries. Correct. Yeah. When we first started, we, we, we'd go to the large distributors and say, do you have superfoods? Do you have organic sugar, organic flour? Quinoa. Do you have quinoa? Do you have anything that's uh, gluten-free? And there was a big zero on every single one. They said, hey, there's no demand for that. So why would we distribute that? So we had to get very creative at the beginning to build our um, supply chain. And then you created the demand. The people started to realize that you were a service that could pro provide their needs that they never had before in a retail or hospitality industry. Exactly. All of a sudden, we're placing some serious orders because, you know, we, we're going from 50 tickets a day or 100 tickets a day to like 500 tickets a day. And it's like, oh, my God, what's going on here? And then they have to start looking because, you know, now they have a uh, they have a business um, and they know we're going to build another and maybe more after that. So the demand actually did dictate it and they could start looking around to see and then we could evaluate and, and test it. Um, even like, for example, the Beyond Meat folks, they heard about us in Texas. They had prototypes. They they weren't really they didn't have a finished product yet. So they gave us a lot to play with and we got to playing with it and say, OK, you can improve texture or taste or cooking or uh, doing different things. So they were still developing their business to try and create demand. So it was a very fun business. I mean, we had a lot of fun. And it's fun and it's fun to be profitable and it's fun yes. to be successful and it's fun to have lots of people want to be um a part of it. That was the glory days, right? That was. Yeah, that was a that was a joy. Um and you know, at the end of the day, it, you know you're doing something good. We we knew um for example, we had the first and still the only restaurant in Houston that had solar power on it. That was in the Heights. And um but it all made business sense when we did it. And that, yeah. that's what a lot of folks don't understand. Now, we were just doing it for marketing. It actually made sound business sense. Yeah. Uh, Tell them about how much waste, the problem with the waste and how you diverted that. And then. Yeah. The, uh, the other part of our uh, meeting our requirements to be a certified green restaurant um, was we had to find ways to compost and recycle, especially recycle. And that was almost impossible because when we began, there was no commercial recycling. There was no commercial composting facilities in Houston. Um, we would quickly find out as we started talking to different groups to pick it up that it was like, wow, you know, we generate like 10 times more than an average. Well, actually, they said 50 to 100 times more than an average household would. That's what restaurants would be doing. So if you focus on the restaurants and their glass and cardboard and other recyclables, you can make a pretty darn good impact. So we had to go out there and find these different groups. In some cases, we, we'd even tell them, hey, this is great. I'm glad you're here. You guys are really good, but you're not charging us enough. <laughs> you should charge us a little bit more because fuel costs have gone up. We want you to stick around. So we sort of held their hands, too, as they were trying to build their business. Uh, in the Houston market, but yeah, we yeah. learned. Well, I just wanted to mention to the audience who may not know, but the restaurant industry is one of the largest contributors to waste in of as as far as industries go, right? Because think about it: all those little single-use plastics, every little fork, every little ramekin that you get some ketchup in, every little lid that has to be nicely contained, especially during COVID everything got more disposable and it was just painful to, I don't know, Federico, for you, it was painful for me to watch how much plastic we had to oh, yeah. use during COVID because my brain was just going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, plastic, plastic, waste, waste, waste. No, no, you're right. Um, and by the way, that was another aspect of our uh, certified green status that we could not use styrofoam. 
and uh, they didn't they would allow plastics that were recyclable but they would prefer something different we were the first ones in houston to roll out biodegradable containers and as you know we tested like 20 30 40 different brands till we found the one that was just right and the ones that were close we talked to the manufacturer so they put a pla coating on it or something that would help it hold up more maybe redesign it a little bit so we also helped a lot of those companies where well, they were trying to get going but now it's fairly commonplace but remember back then styrofoam was a nickel <laughs> biodegradable container was 50 cents <laughs> 10 times more so nobody wanted to do that now it's getting closer to a nickel, but it's probably more like 19 cents. Yeah. And just to educate the audience, a lot of it's bagasse, which is what a form of sugar cane, right? Yeah. Sugar cane waste. Raw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I remember um, at one sustainability festival, I grabbed one of our cups and I started to put hot tea from the path of tea in it. <laughs> it just dissolved. <laughs> it dissolved in my hand. It just went, yeah. you know, yeah. it just it went everywhere. And I was like, oh, I forgot. These are not plastic, you know? Yeah, that was probably a corn based polymer. I know. That we were testing. I know. It was so like, what a lesson. My hand was burning. And it, yeah. I was like, I never did that again. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> great for cold drinks. Let's avoid the hot ones. Yes, yes I learned the hard way. Yeah. Okay. So, so yes, we had a lot of fun um, not only doing this stuff, but also educating. You know, that was part of my job was to get the word out and get the message out and share with the community what we were doing so that the community would support us through so those who were concerned from an altruistic and we, we helped, you know, plant trees and give back. And it was a great, great time. And so you basically grew that to a multi, multi-million dollar company, you and your partners, mm -hmm. and then you and somebody wanted it, right? So you ended up selling it in 2016. Yeah, in 2016, we had um, five units that were operational, everyone profitable, and we were working on our sixth store in, in Cyprus. Um, for a variety of reasons, it was really time to move forward and move on. And the main <clears throat> thing I wanted to focus on was hydroponics, because we were growing some things hydroponically, but in a very small scale. I just felt that the, the promise and the future for hydroponics was much, much greater. Um, I just see that there were so many issues happening with climate change, and it seemed like hydroponics could really address a lot of those issues if it was done on a massive scale. But that technology was just starting to emerge in the late 2000s for commercial food production. I mean, yeah, and let me just add that you were sharing with me the other day when we were talking about it that while you were in the restaurant industry you were asking for we rent y'all ran out of product and microgreens and you're like okay where can we get some microgreens and then that's where the light bulb went off when you couldn't get microgreens in your own texas state you know so tell that little story real quick because sure. that's that's what got you to go want to produce something where you saw that there was a supply chain issue right you're trying to solve not oh, yeah. only supply chain issues, but then you ended up figuring out how how nutrition is how much nutrition was involved. Yeah, well, one of the things that we did, um, and we didn't have to do it, but I just felt that it was important was try to have a, a healthier, better tasting menu. Uh, focus on the healthier, not just gluten free, but also superfoods. So we were looking at hemp, we were looking at quinoa, we we're looking at acai, we were looking at microgreens. The problem was there was really nothing in Houston on it like a large scale. I had to import hemp from Canada directly from the maker. Uh, microgreens, we had nothing. We, we found a group in Colorado that would ship them to us, but they only had one. It was daikon radish, nothing else. So it was- <laughs> Which it was, is not flavorful, right? It's got too much flavor. It's got a lot of bitterness to it. Yeah, if you, if you're, if you like radish, you'll love it, but if not, it's super bitter. Because as you know, with microgreens, the flavor is actually magnified quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and not only that, but every now and then there would be supply chain interruptions where like, oh, these um, this particular uh, microgreens that you were looking for, we don't have any. Maybe in a month they'll be back or, hey, we're all out of mint. There's a drought in the West and our supplier in Mexico has some issues. So you won't see mint for the next three weeks, you know, and you might be using mint on everything, all, a lot of your desserts or your drinks. And now there's no mint. 
So I kept seeing more and more supply chain issues. And then I'd go to some of these food distributors and they were just piles of produce that were like, yeah, we only keep it so long because we have new stuff coming in. We can't hold it that long. It's still good, but it's already hitting its life. So we just got to dump it and they would just have containers, just huge dumpsters just filled with this stuff. So food waste. It was managing the supply chain that, that I started realizing that there's a lot of food waste just trying to get from these thousands of miles away. I think <clears> the <throat> average is 1600 miles right now in the US to get something from your farm to your table. So that's a long distance and you got to time it just right to get it to market. So, um, but yeah, at that point we started just growing our own microgreens and growing some other things to meet the farm demand. And then eventually a few years later, we started seeing some small farms that would start carrying, you know, specialty mint or herbs and, and or microgreens. And that made it a little bit easier because we were trying to buy locally as much as possible, but it was so limited um, as far as timing and the amount that they had. So that, that's really what got me thinking if 99% of the demand is here in the city, you should have at least 50% of the production near the city. And right. If, and that's not the current model we have. The current model we have is 99% of the demand in the city and 99% of the supply at least 1,000 miles away from the city. Right. So to piece this together for the audience, basically you saw that the, the ability to get the product was so far away from the city and what happened is you were like, wow, how do I grow? Uh, what, you used to say the most farms are like within 60 miles of a city, right? They're 60 miles out. Mm -hmm. And so um, basically you brought that brought back your knowledge of hydroponics. You're like, how do I grow in a small area close to the location where the consumer is going to be able to eat it and use it? Bing, 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 hydroponics can grow in a small land space. So that's where the, I want to just bring that to the um, audience's thoughts. Like you wanted to bring food to the city, but how do you do that? You, the, in fact, let's talk about that. The city of Houston did not want you to create a farm, <laughs> a, not, not to mention a commercial farm inside yeah. their city limits remember that challenge that oh, was yeah. so painful right yeah i mean i i'll be honest with you this is probably the most difficult project i've ever worked on in my life I yeah mean, I've, i know I've worked, I've worked on some pretty hard and difficult problems and you go 24 7 you don't stop so i mean you yeah. eat, drink and sleep this challenge so kudos to you but yeah let's let's tell the audience what it's taken yeah. to get to where you are today. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounded good. But remember in 2000 and I'd say 15, when I'm doing all this research, you get some emerging technologies in your reading. And of course there's hydroponics for marijuana production, which is great. Everybody's doing that, especially in Canada. But in Holland, they're doing some very interesting things and their technology is there. And they're doing all kinds of food production. So that's the first place you would look. But the, the capital costs to do something like that in the city were very high, not to mention most cities in the United States at that time, I don't know about now, but at that time, actually had city ordinances that did not allow commercial farming within city limits. Right. Because why? Let's tell the audience why. Because of the waste water? <laughs> Typically, the, the ordinance was based on very sound reasonings. It's like, oh, number one, you need a lot of land. Number two you're gonna apply manure or compost and you're gonna have a smell and you're gonna have an odor nuisance. Number three, you probably use fertilizer and it's gonna create all kinds of runoff and the runoff is gonna get into the storm drain and that's gonna create all kinds of problems. Number four, we, we have, uh, you're gonna use a lot of water and- Yeah, Houston, city water, clean city, city water, water. Or groundwater and they would not allow that because Houston has a subsidence issue. But Houston is not alone, almost every major city at that time, I don't know about now, but at that time had ordinances against commercial food production. Right. Commercial Large product. manufacturing. Yeah, because they think there's going to be livestock and pigs and whatever. And then um, and we had to explain to them that this model was different. And they're, we're they're growing on tables. We're growing above ground. It's like a big nursery and it's hydroponics. And I had to explain what hydroponics was. And so, but all the water you're going to use, I said, 
No, hydroponics uses a fraction of the water. I know. And at this point, you're basically educating the mayor. Remember when? Yeah. yeah. So I had to meet with uh, various folks in the city. So it was a good year of constant meetings and explaining to them. I and know. not only that, but another, a little bit over a year just to get our permit. Yeah, the plans. Get the plans to and grow. explain to everything it. to them. But um, but yeah, the, the, they did not understand that the systems we have are closed loop. We don't. We don't discharge water. And, and in fact, how much less water do you use to grow like a similar amount of crop? Easily 90% less. Yeah. Because you're recycling it, the water, right? We're recycling it. We're only watering the roots. Everything's covered. You're not spraying water everywhere. You're not, you don't, you're not right. subject to a lot of evaporation. The plants are drinking from the bottom and they're only uptaking what they need. They get to monitor how much they use and anything else is not considered waste. Correct. Yeah. So um, I, after a year or so of explaining, we finally got our permits and we got everything ready to go. And, and remember, we were at the time vetting a lot of different technology as well. So we were looking at an indoor flood and drain system. Um, and, you know, look good. Vertical and a vertical system. Right. We were the first indoor vertical farm, I believe, in Texas, but I know in Houston for sure. Uh, although Horde America says we're probably the first ones in Texas. Um, but it was mostly to test the technology, see what works and what doesn't work. And is it worthwhile? Um, so we built a 10 foot tall towers and flood and drain five levels. And we we're mostly growing microgreens and some specialty herbs. Right. And that's when the demand was only through restaurants at that time, not really grocery commercial level. Correct. Yeah. Grocers were not interested because there was not that much market demand for micros. Yeah. This was just specialty chefs of high end restaurants. Exactly. Just like what. Well, just like we, we were the number one user, uh, number one consumer of microgreens when we had our five stores. <clears throat> I mean, we we used a lot of micros, but we use we also used a lot of um, uh, specialty micros, and we also had uh, we're, we're really focused on the health benefits of microgreens. So that's why we did that. But in general, the the stores were not selling because it was two reasons. Number one, the demand wasn't there. And number the second one was the shelf life was so short on a lot of these microgreens. Um, if, if you grow in soil, the sh we, we tested it. We did side by side. The shelf life is about a third of what we got when we were growing in uh, um, hydroponically. So that's why the chefs loved our product. They're like, oh, my God, I got it in the fridge. It's been a week. It's still good. Everything's crisp and flavorful. And there's no degradation. What are you guys doing differently? Well, we're going in hydroponically and we have a special blend. And so they were very pleased with that, but that was only the restaurant market. Uh, we needed to get it into the supermarket shelves. And we were mostly learning about the technology. And, and at the time we realized in order to make a, a practical business out of this, you need volume, you need capacity. We need to do 10 times, 20 times more of several different crops. So that's why we, and that's where the real permitting headache started with the city of Houston, because we were going to build our 20,000 square foot facility on the, the five acres we had just purchased. So Right. But it only took, what, half an acre, right, to use the greenhouse for yeah, the actual growing space? Correct. We're only growing on half an acre. And, and honestly, in that half acre, we produce like 20, 25 times more than what we were doing in our indoor vertical growing facility. Okay, so, let's tell the audience, like, now you're growing in these large troughs, you're growing lettuce. So how many heads of lettuce can the half an acre produce in a, what is it, a, a 50 to 60 day turnaround yeah, cycle? We uh, Theoretically, um, with, <laughs> now that we know what we know, we didn't know what we knew back then. But right now, we are we could probably produce about um, easily a thousand heads a day. Thousand head, a thousand pounds a day of, of lettuce. Um, if we, that's the old design that we have in place. We have the means now to produce six times that much per day in the same on, footprint. On half, right? On, on half, half an acre. acre. Yes. So, do you actually know what it takes in an acreage to grow like that kind of production? Like, what are we comparing it to really with all the people in the ground using it in the ground? 
Yeah, typically you need 10 times more than that. You need five. To produce the same amount of. Correct. Output. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, what that brings me to is that article that you sent me last week mm -hmm. about the water crisis yeah. that's coming in 2030. So actually, you know, we've, we've said a lot about just in the introduction, although I want to jump in, it's a good segue for helping the audience understand the crisis, number one, that's coming, but also how hydroponics is a possible, is a solution to that crisis. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about that article you sent me? Sure, sure. The, um, in fact, I'm trying to pull it was up. The, it was the Guardian. <laughs> It yeah, the Guardian, so and it was, um, you know, which is a professed uh, outlet of media that doesn't take um, funds from sponsors, so they can say whatever they need to say to let the people know the truth. And so they're sharing the truth. And they basically said in 2030, which yeah. is only literally, this is 2023, we are yeah. seven years away from what they're predicting is going to happen with water. So right. I was shocked that it was so uh, coming so right soon. Now, yeah, right now, water, most of our water consumption is used for agriculture, bottom line. And much of it is for livestock, you know, um, uh, taking care of, you know, growing grass and fodder and other grain crops or whatever for livestock. Um, and there's huge subsidies for that. The problem is they're predicting by 2030, um, we're going to be 40% short on the amount of water that we actually have available. Globally. Globally, which means there's going to be massive droughts and obviously famines because that water should really be used for, <laughs> for taking care of humans. And for human consumption, yeah. If you don't have it for human consumption, it doesn't matter if you're trying to grow crops because the humans won't there's no one to eat it. it. Exactly. So it's like, so they have to do something. The, the, the issue right now is just uh, the current technologies are incredibly wasteful. So the reason, and by the way, it's another reason why I started looking very closely at hydroponics, because I felt that um, the promise was way, the impact on a global scale was way more beneficial than just having certified green restaurants. That's nice. And you can educate. But having the right technology that, that, that you will then uh, engage with schools on and uh, start uh, creating networks and building, uh, people understand the technology and say, wow, that is really cool. We need that in our community. We need that in our city. All of a sudden, you can address a lot of those issues, not to mention, you know, being growing locally, you just you have all kinds of positive aspects that where you don't uh, you're really starting to reduce the amount of climate impact and uh, especially greenhouse gas emissions that you're that you're generating con compared to the conventional way of doing things right for transportation for, for transportation, transportation and just logistics general, and even just the normal process of plowing the earth and doing all that we, we like to say we we're very uh how do you say, we are definitely better for the earth because we don't touch the earth we just grow on top of it we never plow it we never we just leave the earth alone you don't till the soil and there's a lot of carbon inside the soil that when you till it it gets escapes right because that's a way that the earth supports itself is by absorbing the carbon so we don't have to it's yeah human, human life um i do want to address nitrous oxide emissions are all generated by normal uh, tilling. So we don't do any of that. Yeah. I want to just mention part of the article said that be, the reason that agriculture is one of the more wasteful forms of the water system, you know, the water processes is because as it's subsidized, the agricultural industry is not motivated to fix their leaks or to find solutions because they're just putting a band aid. Well, oh, the government will pay for our water, let's just not worry about it. That's let's let's leave that problem for someone in the future when it's really a problem. <laughs> and so and so what I wanted to highlight you is because I recognize that your passion and your bringing all your history and your experience together is coming together in a moment in time when the world is going to understand the problem that you're trying to solve. And, and just in an industry, I'm not saying you're not the only one right. who's solving this problem. I'm just saying you're trying to be part of the solution 
instead of just putting blinders on and saying, this is not happening, you know? No, that's, that's correct. And, then and, and you're doing it for our city, you know, the fourth largest city in the United States, but hopefully you'll be able to take your education and your information that you've learned in this little pocket of the country and offer it to other people who are looking for solutions in their areas. Yeah, and I mean, we've been we've actually been contacted by cities all across the globe. You know, I uh, remember Italy. Remember, they wanted you to help figure out how to grow fodder for their beef for yeah. their cows. Yeah, they had a uh, it was Parma, Italy, and they had a very strong dairy industry, and they were actually having to import grass from Germany. I mean, importing grass because they were going through a severe drought and they had no grass and dairy cows have to have a certain amount of grass. In fact, mostly grass just so they can produce <laughs> quality milk. Can you imagine a world without Parmigiano? Yeah. <laughs> like the world would realize there's a real crisis going on. So they were, there's no so, more Parmigiano. Uh, so they were definitely looking for ways to do all that. And the solutions are, are here. I mean, I, that's another reason why I'm a big believer in what hydro not just hydroponics for growing crops, but you know it can do a lot of other things as well, which which I definitely learned about through my NASA experience. But right now, because of the water crisis, I mean, people don't realize when when water gets short, you know, you start getting attention very quickly. The Western uh, United States, especially with California, Arizona, New Mexico, primarily California, that severe drought really impacted them and a lot of those food producers in california is like one of the bread baskets of the united states they had to mandate that they cut back by 30 percent their water consumption otherwise people were going to start dying so it's like they these farmers are like what are we going to do so right now a lot of those large farms are moving their operations to mexico and south of the border um, and by the way, they're having their own drought issues, too. They were just not having them quite as bad as California was. So now your distance from farm to table is even further away. So that distance every year keeps growing further and further away. But you still need water. I mean, if, if they were doing it, if, if they had hydroponics or they were doing it a little bit uh, more um, efficiently, they probably wouldn't have to move their operations to Mexico. The other thing you don't think about is when your organizations are not quality controlling your crops and some other countries' mechanisms are either controlling or not controlling the quality, mm -hmm. then you, you lose the ability to know and trust what you're getting. So buying local, knowing your farmer, knowing their and you know what they're committed to, you know, th these are all reasons to know your farmer. No, I totally agree. Um, the, the good thing about it is a lot of these credible organizations, you know, south of the border, they are definitely wanting to earn their place. But still, it's it's such a long distance to produce there and then move it all over here to carbon emissions and just getting here. And as you know, every day that you that that food travels, you lose nutrition. I think the average is around 10 percent. So you could be getting crops where it's like, oh, vitamin C. Well, not really. You maybe 20% of the original vitamin C or 50% if you're lucky. Um, or maybe there's some nutrients that we learned through NASA and MD Anderson that are only good for 24 hours and they're no longer there after 24 hours. So in the regular diet, you never see those very healthy phytonutrients that are, you know, cancer fighting and all that. You just don't see them in there. So right. our supply chain has a lot to do with our nutrition. Yeah. Not not to mention, like, remember during COVID, everybody was worried about how many hands were touching, you know, the product before it got to you. Uh -huh. You know, like, there's just less touching and less manipulation of a product if it's coming from a closer distance versus, like, further away. You can't control right. it as much. Plus, like, insects and bugs and, I mean, all of that. No, no, you're right. And then, I mean, you can still be an organic farm and a regular farm doing your thing, and that's fine. But um, I think we had a little t-shirt that said, no, no dirt, no poop, no problems. <laughs> <laughs> because, if we did it, we need one. Yeah, I made one and it was like, it, but it, it made sense because really there's no reason to have dirt or poop on your product. You know what? You, you are segueing me so nicely. Now let's talk about... <laughs> 
the Consumer Reports article that came out March 2020. What else happened for the world on March 2020 for the United States? I mean, let's talk about that article. I think it got lost in the COVID crisis. But let's talk about that article because that was so fascinating to learn that. Let me just say this one thing I remember about it, that the lettuce is one of the most deadly contaminated food sources, even over poultry, even over beef, even over fish, you know, oysters, all these things you think are horribly difficult to ingest and dangerous. It was lettuce. Remember? I couldn't believe that information yeah, from consumer the, reports. Which, which is the most dangerous food you can eat. Yes. So and surprising. Everybody, everybody was shocked. So the most dangerous, because based on statistics, most people get sick, either of food poisoning or the death. Salmonella, or yeah. Salmonella, E. coli from lettuce. And, you know, that's why we had all these romaine lettuce recalls and this other lettuce recalls. But you got to remember, a lot of that lettuce is usually grown in the ground. And, right. and primarily in Arizona and California is what they said. 90% correct. of the United States population of lettuce that we eat comes from Yuma, Arizona, or somewhere in California, right? Well, it was 90% back then. It's no longer 90%. Right. 70% now, because a lot of it's coming from Mexico. Well, and education. And education. But really back then, the problem, the root cause was lack of water. So they were looking for water sources to irrigate the crops. And that technology, they don't water the roots, they top water. So it's like, oh, it's dry, they spray or whatever. And if you don't have really clean water, that then that whatever spray you're going to get is going to get entrenched in that um, that lettuce head. Let me add, you just said clean water. What I remember about the article is, you know, everyone's driven by a farm on a road trip and they see these big sprayers, you know, psh, 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 psh spraying lots of land, lots of crop, but they were getting a lot of that water from uh, irrigation from the Colorado River. So whatever is floating around in that river is, you know, waste from animals, deer, elk, uh, birds, whatever is all being sprayed, top water sprayed on top of your crops, right? Right. And so that's why hydroponics who uses clean water typically is the safer you know option but basically that's one of the ways that the lettuce gets contaminated right yeah consumer reports pretty much at the end of their article said we highly recommend greenhouse grown or hydroponically grown produce for safety reasons because when it's out in the field and out in the open and you don't really know what the water source is and it's sprayed on top. But remember, it's still out in the open. Things can happen when it's out in the open. Well, the deer, out. animals. I mean, they had, I remember they yeah. talked about having guards with guns killing the animals at night so that they don't go onto their crops. I mean, that's crazy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. They'd eat up all the crops, especially wild boars and things like that. I mean, think so. about PETA. If PETA really knew how that lettuce was grown. <laughs> That I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but the, the 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 irony is uh, the technology is here and it's getting less and less costly to implement. Back when we were doing it, it was like okay, well, there's everyone's trying to figure it out, and is it going to be an indoor vertical system or a greenhouse system, or you know, is it going to be these pumps or this technology or these LED lights or these uh, NFT versus flood and drain? I mean, there was all kinds of different ways of going about it. But the end of, at the end of the day, you want something that's the least costly, but the most effective. And that's what we've been working on. And that was, you know, as you start any new venture, it's incredibly difficult trying to figure that out. And fortunately, we, you know, we saw the mistakes that were being made by other groups that were doing it. We'll say, okay, we're not going to do that. We're not going to build these multi-million dollar systems that are just crazy. But at the same time here in Houston, you know, we had we had Hurricane Harvey, for example, that shut us down for a while and delayed permitting and delayed everything, our implementation. And then you couldn't find contractors to build find your systems. For over a year. So that delayed us and that was painful and costly. And then when we got into our facility where we're actually starting to grow, then uh, 
COVID. Had, yeah, COVID. We had our, our grand opening was scheduled for COVID. <laughs> I mean, it was like our grand opening was supposed to be April 2020. All the contracts we had looked great, and all of a sudden they disappear like in two weeks. Uh, gone. Uh, wait, wait, let me put that into perspective. We primarily were servicing the chef, hospitality, hotels, and restaurants. And on Mar I was responsible for the relationship between the farm and those customers. And on March 17th, my phone blew up. Everybody canceled their orders. I was told their restaurants were shutting down and that have completely affected our business in like the worst way. We didn't have anybody to buy, but what did we do? We shifted and decided to start serving the direct to home market during COVID. So we had to find a solution to get our produce out to the people for consumption in Correct. their homes yeah so that was that was it was a major shift because we had a we we're already speaking with distributors some fairly large distributors and you know 80 i would say at least 60 percent of their uh, their base were restaurants and bars and hotels so they were impacted as well they couldn't buy from us if their customers were closed so it was just a really painful time to so painful. Get go. and it was like there was no income month after month after month, just trying to figure out how to pivot as quickly as we could and keep the doors open. Meanwhile, we're still doing R&D to find out ways to scale the technology and what works and what doesn't work. On the R&D front, we did very well. We learned a lot of very uh, useful things as far as getting costs down, being super efficient, something that will grow very well, a higher quality product at a lower cost. So I thought we were really good on that, but you're a business, you got to keep the doors open. And so it was a very trying two year period um, for us to get that. But I know, uh, I'm right really now, just I, to get launched. Oh, it was just the worst launch possible. <laughs> but with that said, we somehow or another we survived and um, we're still holding on. And business now, now all of a sudden, uh, demand. Growth, demand is just crazy right now. And then you can't grow enough. You need more farms to grow for the demand. That's correct. Now we're in the opposite situation. We went from COVID where there was interest, but all of a sudden COVID hits and no demand at all, zero. So now like huge demand. People are starting to understand more about hydroponics. Schools are contacting us every day, wanting to learn more about hydroponics. Not just schools, but whole independent school districts yes. are school contacting district. you. The whole district is wanting to know. When I was there, we had the largest school district, HISD, come visit and saw the vision for education, not only nutritionally, but also on sustainability information. Correct. And it was, it's interesting because, you know, during COVID, we're, we get, kept getting calls from schools and we had no idea why they would be interested in what we were doing. But it was really, it was driven not from science or from farm clubs or anything. It was driven by nutrition. It was a nutritional services group in all the schools that were saying, hey, we're concerned about the quality of what's coming into our schools. It's not very good. USDA wants us to buy more local, but there is no local not for the volumes that we need. There's no right. local. And, um, and what's going on with this hydroponic stuff? Um, so that's why they kept calling us wanting to learn more because they also wanted to get a higher, more nutritious uh, quality product, um, but at the same time find local sources. So that was really the catalyst that started changing everything. Right. And that's right now where we're at. Can I mention, I want to mention something that I was kind of proud of. Um, while I was with you working there, um, my alma mater, which is an agricultural and mechanics university, this is university level where you learn about everything, the Texas A&M Dean of Agriculture and his group of people from all over their locations came to visit to see what we were doing, to understand how we were doing it like basically you were educating the university and i loved it it was like such a proud moment for me to have been from that school and it was funny because i remember thinking 
I never went to college thinking I was going to be in agriculture. And somehow my life journey got me to this point where I'm actually helping with, you know, this challenge and this food thing. So I have to say that I would, that was a proud moment for me that you were able to help them kind of understand. And it built great relationships because you're still in relationship with some of the people that you met during that time. And it was a really good learning opportunity. Yeah. And I'll go a step further. We're still working with Texas A&M. Um, it, and NASA actually reached out to us with their Space Alliance Technical Outreach Group. They, uh, they actually gave us a grant uh, where Texas A&M are building our new uh, hydroponic grow towers. So they're actually building the prototypes right now at uh, Bryan College Station at A&M. In fact, I have a call with them, um, I think today, but I'm going to double check. Yeah. <laughs> today or tomorrow, just to see where they are in there. So I'll be visiting them. So we're still working very closely with A&M. They're still seeing what we're doing. But we also have a very close tie with NASA. And as you know, the name Moonflower Farms comes from your dream my my crazy wild crazy dream that i had it back in 2014 2015 of helping nasa to put flowers on the moon um ironically i it was a nasa a colleague of mine who called me and says hey i hear you're doing dabbling in hydroponics and you're gonna be building a farm yeah and he goes maybe you can help us put flowers on the moon and it was my wife who said call it moonflower <laughs> So that's that's how we got our name. Yeah. And like you can see in my background, I believe you have to dream and believe in order to create. That's right. <laughs> so everything that's ever been created starts from a vision and a dream. So you got to dream big if you're going to actually try to achieve big things. In in wrapping up, I want there's there's one thing I want us to mention that I think is a really important aspect of this conversation that I want the world to learn about, and that is um, there is a health crisis out there as well. And what we learned um, working with a major cancer institution here in the city was that there was a lot of research around microgreens helping with certain illnesses because they have talk a little bit i want the audience to know because the reason we're not growing microgreens is because there's no consumer demand for it as the consumer demand increases the farms like moonflowers can grow it for the large companies like kroger heb um you know apple whatever that apple what is it called apple tree or something what's the name of that um <laughs> There's a store that I'm thinking of called something Apple. Anyway, um, the Safeway, you know, all the big stores around the country, when the demand is there, and like what we know is that there's a need, a health need, but the consumers don't know that there's a health need. So there's no market for microgreens. So let's talk about what you learned. Tell a little bit of the science about why you were trying to grow microgreens from a health perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, having the restaurant train, the the restaurant chain that we had, and really focusing on nutrition and superfoods. One of the first things you come up with when you're researching superfoods is like, oh wow, microgreens, you know, forty times more this and ten times more that, and some of these phytonutrients are like super cancer fighting isothiocyanates. I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. So that's why. And then we just had to get the right ones that had the right flavor, of course. So we learned a lot just from the restaurant industry, but it was such a fairly new, I mean, microgreens really weren't popularized till the late eighties. They came out of California by, uh, I think it was a chef named Charlie Trotter, but, but then, then all of a sudden they started getting more and more popular in the nineties and the two thousands, but really working with MD Anderson and NASA, they were fascinated by, certain phytonutrients that were in those microgreens and how these phytonutrients could help um, uh, uh, protect us against certain forms of cancer or protect us against UV radiation or just uh, it, uh, make uh, just provide more nutrition per the amount. So I don't need to eat four pounds of broccoli. I can eat two ounces of broccoli microgreens. So that's where it got interesting. And then I reached out to MD Anderson um, uh, through a colleague of mine at NASA, and we were looking at ways to uh, mitigate the effects of radiation. 
on astronauts and in, in, uh, by certain microgreens. So we did a little study. We looked at about 10 different microgreens and we had a positive hits for two of them. And they were very interesting data that we got. I mean, it was interesting enough that MD Anderson said, okay, is this a mistake? So they did, repeated it again twice. So they ran the test three times and said, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> so that's where we, that's where we're at right now, but that's a, you know, that's another a grant that we're going to have to raise to pursue that. But there's a lot of information there and there's definitely a lot of benefits from microgreens that we just don't know anything about, like red cabbage microgreens and how they help regulate insulin levels and could be potential for people who are fighting obesity or diabetes um, or broccoli microgreens and the sulforaphane content and isothiocyanates and how they would be very beneficial for cancer fighting. And you don't have to eat pounds of broccoli. You can just eat ounces of my, these broccoli microgreens. So, and you can easily get them local. Yes. Yeah. The, the fresher they are, the more powerful they are, right? Nutritionally. That is correct. And and some are better live than cut, you know, because sometimes when you when you cut crops, certain enzymes get produced and they it tells the crop, OK, it's time to degrade. And so a lot of these healthy phytonutrients start to disappear within a 24 hour period. So we learned that, too, from the study. Right. So um, right now we are actually selling microgreens in the Kroger locations that we're in now. Some stores are actually, because of the demographics, are actually doing pretty well. I'd say 80% of them, people don't really know that much about them, so we have to educate them, but they're not moving well there. They want the, the live basils and the live lettuce. But there's definitely some interest, and I think there'll be more interest once we get some production up there. So we're in a, it's difficult to educate the market but we will definitely be able to supply it once um, I think that demand is there. I'm hoping this podcast episode is educating the market. That's my intention. <laughs> I so, appreciate that, Lydia. Yeah, no, I love, I mean, you're, this is important. You know, this is my contribution to helping the world understand that there are solutions out there, but they're not always easily accessible. So I would say like some of the challenges you would face now are just scaling, having enough money to just grow the demand, you know, grow the crop for the demand. So you're talking to investors and working with different investors in different ways to help you. You have a solution. You just need the funding to help solve the problem. Right. Exactly. I mean, when we first started, it was a little I mean. You have to have a dream. Sometimes it's a crazy dream, but you have to start with dream. And we thought that we could find a market for micros, but that market is very, very small. And because of the delays we had, and then as, especially after COVID, it was like, oh my God, no one's buying anything. It was incredibly hard. So we we literally ran out of money. I had to sell stock and do all kinds of crazy stuff. But right now we're in the opposite position grocers really do want local because yes. the, the demand is there. Well, and wait, and I'll just say COVID helped wake up the Correct. grocers that they need a local supplier because when they were trying to get their product during COVID from California, they couldn't get anybody to deliver it. So they had nothing to sell. That is correct. And they're, and you're going to see more and more grocers changing their entire supply chain away from these big mega farms to local regional or city farms. Right. We've been talking to a couple different grocers for the last two years since 20 into 2021. And they're, they're definitely starting to make those changes now. But in our particular case, we have schools coming at us. We have different chains coming at us. We have, we need to be producing three times more now without even trying than we currently can. Um, but so all of a sudden so we're, you need more infrastructure basically more to infrastructure. meet the demand. Correct. Cause we, we definitely have demand. We positioned ourselves well. We learned a lot working with, uh, the, the Kroger stores that we've been building on and also talking to these other groups. So now it's like, okay, now the demand is really starting to, to grow and we have other chains that are interested and it's like, there's no way we could produce what they're looking for right now. The consumption that they need. 
Yeah, and then it could be that we're in one or two stores, but it's they want us in 10 or 20 or 30. Yeah, without saying any names, I remember this one particular scenario where they wanted like they were selling, was it 30,000 heads a day that was yeah. going out of their grocery store? Right. And right now we can do a thousand heads a day. Right. So you need more farming, growing systems. But the good the beauty of it is we have now the technology to do that five times more in the same footprint without right. building anything else. So that's great. Now we're really making a dent moving in the right direction. Right. So I know that I'm going to wrap it up here. I know that there's a, some wonderful consultants that have been in this business for 20 plus years. I know you're in communication with a lot of them, but I would have to say from just your five years, what has it been like since 2017? So almost eight years now. Gosh, is that right? Is that right? It's 20. It's five years. We're in 2023. Okay. Um, yeah, six years. So um, that you have been through so much of the ringer that you have become a subject matter expert by default, just through a very short window of time, right? And so I mean, I'm, I'm talking to the Texas A&M professors and the NASA folks, and you know, we we've seen a lot. I mean, we've done it. We we haven't theorized. We haven't read it. Right. You lived it. We lived it. And really, when we started, I would say 90 percent of what we were reading online or was wrong. So that was a yeah, shock. And you tried it. You tested it. I mean, because actually at the heart of you, go back to your story. You're a scientist. You like to test things. That's where you get it. You enjoy the yeah. testing and the learning, you know, so you're testing all this stuff that everyone on YouTube or the industry is talking about. And it's not necessarily working for your way. Maybe not on a commercial scale. On a small scale, I might be cute. It might work nicely in your patio garden or something. Yeah, and give you a small mom and pop business, but you can't solve world problems no. as a mom and pop little shop out of your garage. No, you need you need some very reliable systems that do a variety of things. And there's a lot more to it. <laughs> as long yeah, as well, if, if you enjoyed your time today, we'll have you back. We can talk about more specific, dive deeper into specific subjects and topics to create episodes around your knowledge base. But if anybody wants to get in touch with you or find you, what are some of the best ways they can go look you up online and connect with you? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably your best bet. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. And then, honestly, you can go to our website, moonflowerfarms.com. There's a way to connect through our website, moonflowerfarms.com. Or you can just send an email to info at moonflowerfarms.com. Okay, perfect. Is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience before we go? Or anything I didn't ask you about or cover that you think you need to mention? No, no, no. I really appreciate you reaching out to me, Lydia. And like I said, we're doing some very innovative, very cool things. And um, like I said, it's a totally different position going through crisis mode of everything just disappearing to like, oh, my God, demand is crazy. Um, so it's it's a nice transition. But now we have to be able to. You have new, <laughs> you have new problems. <laughs> exactly. Now it's like, oh, we have a demand. We need supplies so bad. And I'm working on that. But but I will say this, I'm I'm a firm believer that by 2030, every major city in the world is going to need hydroponics, either inside the city or outside the city. Nearby, right? Nearby. I would say less than 100 miles away, you're going to have a hydroponic facilities and they're going to be everywhere. They have to. They solve too many problems for climate change. They solve too many problems for water consumption which is a huge problem that's coming at us very quickly. And, um, and they also solve huge problems in forms of the human population and food needs and nutritional needs. So um, I'm a big believer of that. And I think education is going to be the main force driving that. So that's what we're focused on. Yeah, I love that aspect of the business that you're doing now is the you're educating the kids, the children about the growing process. And then the reason you want to grow this food, why do you want to be in control of being able to grow your own food? Right. Correct. It gives yeah. you more, it gives you more. Ultimately, it gives you more freedom of but, self and your dominion and your life. And then the health aspects of just having locally higher nutrition, better quality product is just, it, it's, 
I think it's going to be transformative. So we'll see. But 2030, I think it's just inevitable that every major city will have to have hydroponic facilities. Yeah. Well, that's a great wrap up. Thank you so much, Federico, for your time today. And I really hope that this message can get out at a global level and that um, people understand what our intentions were for talking about it. And, um, you know, hopefully I can do my part in making the world a better place as well. You always do, Lydia. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you. All right. We'll talk to you later. Hang in there. All right. Thank you, Lydia. Bye. Bye-bye.